And now we move to the Australian Songwriters Hall of Fame Award. And I'd like you to welcome to the stage a man that we uh, quite often refer to as a guy who doesn't really need an introduction because I think his name says it all. But one of these nights, I'm going to do an intro for this man that is going to be even longer than the speech he usually gives tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Glenn A. Baker. I was ensnared. Denny Burgess, who had led a band that loomed large in my adolescent consciousness, The Throb, rang me one day and asked if I would come along to his Songwriters Awards and induct into its Hall of Fame the most venerable Stevie Wright, George Young and Harry Vander of the Easy Beats. Only Stevie was on hand to be honoured that night, but it was an offer not possible to refuse. After that, then he packed me in dry ice and stored me out the back with the beer kegs. And I kept taking my place on this podium each year to induct other mighty tunesmiths. Brewston Neeson, Brewster of the Angels, Brian Cadd, Ross Wilson, Steve Kilby, Dom Walker, Garth Porter, Kate Sobrano. The thing I came to realise was that this was an honour which songwriters were hugely proud to have presented to them, to have attached to their name, to have on their mantelpiece. This country has a long history of honouring the kings and queens of pop, of honouring hits and chart success, but rarely of recognising the rare and incomparable talent that goes into making all that possible. So here I am again, telling a room of young songwriters that these masters of their craft are the reason popular music exists, the reason it has an incredible hold upon our hearts and imaginations, that while the headlines focus upon the pop stars of any generation, those sometimes ephemeral apparitions would not exist without those in the back room making something glorious out of thin air while the sweat rolls off their brows. Now, to get down to the business, and this is the moment where you decide to become very, very quiet. You understand? Quiet and hushed. For a generation that has grown up watching Johnny Young beam, grin and mug his way through years of young talent time, it may be difficult to view him as an Ozrock pioneer. But let there be no doubt at all that he was a truly pivotal figure in the coming of age of Australian music. By the end of the 60s, it was Vander and Young and Johnny Young who jointly forged a path of rock and pop songwriting in this country, providing a consistent and absolutely credible stream of hits that captured and kept public imagination. After decades of derivation, with only a few minor exceptions, they proved that it was viable and desirable to craft original works. It was so very much a coming of age. Born John de Jong in Rotterdam in 1945, the son of a musician father, Johnny grew up from the age of three in Kalamunda in the Perth Hills of Western Australia, where his career as a singer, composer, disc jockey, television producer and compere and record producer in essence first took flight. His mother was in a choir and engendered his early interest in music. An eager and ambitious lad and a trainee disc jockey on Perth Radio, he spent 18 months as the lead singer of the Nomads, who became The Strangers, and in 1965, he landed the host's role on the teen TV show Club 17. He cracked the Perth charts with two singles on the local 17 label, before being signed by local recording with Martin Clark to the Clarion label, which also boasted the Valentines featuring Bon Scott. He was on the bill when the Easy Beats came to town and he persuaded George Young and Stevie Wright to knock him out a simple but devastatingly effective ditty, which was their trademark. Back with a pounding cover of The Strange Love's Carolyn, Step Back gave Johnny a number one national hit, one of the biggest of 1966. He returned to the summit at the end of the year with an EP led off by Let It, Let it Be Me and was back in the top ten at the beginning of 1967 with another Everly Brothers song, When Will I Be Loved. 
Now, the Easy Beat song notwithstanding, what Australian recording quite obviously needed, particularly when it came to non-group entities, was quality original songs. A point perhaps not lost on the new national pop star sen sensation Johnny Young, who was on the TV screen singing Bobby Hebb's Sonny and other covers like that. As he once told Australian story, from the moment I was able to listen to records, I wanted to be a singer. And by the time I was 17, I had my first television show where I was the host and my band did all the backings and I sang songs on the show as well. From 1965 to 1970, that was my full-on pop star period. It was a fantastic experience, touring, meeting my idols. Hey, I got to meet Bob Dylan. I toured with the Rolling Stones. I was focused on being a pop star and doing concerts and all that stuff and wild and, and was wild and screaming, all, all that it entails. And lots of girls and yes, lots of sex and lots of everything. You know, it's fantastic. And it was a real pop star trip. It was a trip that also included a, a, a bout of opening for Roy Orbison, the, uh, the Walker Brothers and the Yardbirds in stadiums around Australia. Now, a swift move to Melbourne with his backing group company had seen Johnny's fortune soar. He formed a short-lived pop TV show called, I'm sorry, he fronted a short-lived pop TV show called Too Much before being called upon to compare the powerful Go Show after the resignation of Ian Turpey, for which he took out a best teenage personality, Logie. He was back in the top 10 with an engaging treatment of the Beatles All My Loving and was ranked in pop polls just behind Normie Rowe and Ronnie Burns. So by mid-1967, like so many of his contemporaries in the exhilarating Australian pop scene of the mid-60s, he found himself knocking on doors in London, brashly demanding entry. His farewell concert in Australia had seen such luminaries as the Masters Apprentices and Jeff St John and the Id bid him farewell. In the old dart, he was exceptionally fortunate to fall in with his friends from Australia, fellow expatriates, the Bee Gees, who had just become darlings of London. Barry Gibb was, as he had in Australia, writing songs with fervour, and a number of them came Johnny's way, perhaps because he was living with Barry for some months. Not only did Barry and his brothers write and play on songs for Johnny's clarion single releases, releases the sumptuous and quite exquisite Lady, Craze Finton Kirk, I Am The World and Every Christian Lionhearted Man, he actively encouraged his house guest to write songs. Gibb taught him that there are no rules in songwriting. There is a structure, but what you need to do is find the hook and it could be in the melody, the chorus, the words, or even an identifiable riff. And that can be the difference in writing a hit record. Apart from being in the studio when the Beatles recorded All You Need Is Love for the One World Global Telecast and doing a couple of prominent television shows himself, Johnny's greatest achievement during his half year in London was discovering that he could indeed write songs. Barry Gibbard schooled him well, and the compositions flowed from him swiftly and with mounting de dexterity. He was a born songsmith, and the next few years would see him turn Australian songwriting on its head. Though for all his confidence, not even he could have imagined a scenario of penning five number one hits in quick succession. Which is exactly what he set about doing when he came home to pick up his career and to become a drive announcer on, on 3XY. His own releases were the first recipients. There was It's a Sunny Day, a piece of perfect sunshine pop, which gave him his final hit as a recording artist. Unconscientious Objector, After Dark, Mr. Reagan, Mrs. Willoughby, an epitaph, epitaph to Mr. Simon, sir, which has quite a story attached, but perhaps not one to be told here. As it exploded in 1969, Ross D. Wiley, host of Uptight, was coming off a moderate hit and Johnny furnished him with a song that was inspired by his own observations of stardom and its fickle fates. The star connected powerfully and proved so popular that a touring Herman's Hermits covered it for an internationally released single as Here Comes the Star. It was in a dressing room at Channel 10 during a taping of Uptight that Johnny began playing the basic structure of what was, at least then, a relatively simple pop song. Ian Molly Meldrum leapt upon it with his young protege Russell Morris of somebody's image in mind. But what he heard in his head 
was not simple. At his hands, the real thing would become a swirling witch's brew of pop extravagance, complete with Nuremberg rally chants and a nuclear explosion. It featured players from the group and Zoot and was the most complex thing ever heard from an Australian studio. EMI Records was so aghast they tried to wrest it from the control of its mad producer, finally saying they would release it only in Victoria. Meldrum and Morris jumped in a car, went to Sydney and laid siege to disc jockeys, most of whom embraced the, the madness and put it to air. As the 60s approached an end, it was not even a number one smash nationally, but a defining moment in Australian recording with Umau Mau Mau, Umau Mau Mau Mau, incidentally, not in Johnny's original, um, original version, a chant known coast to coast. The song would later be cut by Kylie Minogue for a film soundtrack and issued as a single and album title track by Midnight Oil. Johnny had Russell back to number one shortly after with the delicate and beguiling The Girl That I Love. He co-wrote the other side of the disc, part three into Paper Walls, with, with Russell. Now there was no stopping him. In 1970, Australian chart music pretty much belonged to Johnny Young. He had an idea about a conscript going off to war in Vietnam, basing it around Norm Normie Rowe, although he didn't tell him at the time. Um, Smiley had a wistful, endearing tone that captured attention instantly and underlined the writer's ability to command not just an appealing melody, but deft lyrics that captured a situation in a few powerful lines. Yesterday, there was laughter and songs to sing. Yesterday, we had loving to burn. Now we, no, now we won't see you smile no more. No more laughter in the air. Feel the tension in the air. Where is love? Interestingly, apart from My Ass is Black with Burke Street by Chain, this was about the only Australian song to deal with the Vietnam War. And of course, it was number one. The relationship with Ronnie would go on to include his highly acclaimed Virgo album, for which Johnny wrote every track, some with a range of John Farrah, before he took control of, of, of Farrah took control of Olivia Newton-John's recording career. The Young Burns Association will give us such fine recordings as Jody, Maggie Mine, The Prophet, Love Song, and If I Die. Then we had boxing champ Lionel Rose, who, when asked by Johnny what he wanted to say in a song, thought it should be, graciously, I thank you. And so it was. Another number one, and the first hit by a Curry artist since Jimmy Little's Royal Telephone. It was again arranged by... by indeed. It was arranged by John Farrer again and would later find a new lease of life thanks to being adopted by Roy and H HG. Now, Lionel was no great singer, but the young songs always suited Guitar Pick and Boy, My Little Girl, Pick Me Up on Your Way Down, Please, please Remember Me. Now, while these five number ones loom large in the Johnny Young canon, they are but part of the story. These were songs which, sorry, there were songs which missed but shouldn't have, such as Billy's Bikey Boys, another Meldrum production by a band called, but led by Rick Springfield called Wickedy Whack, a single by Heart and Soul called Let Me Sing in Your Band, Hello, a post-army Normie Rose single, Don't Let Me Give In by Alison Durbin, Who Will Bring the Rain, the theme song from the film Country Town by Bobby Bright of Bobby and Laurie. Then, not much more than three years after it exploded, this intense burst of creativity came to a, a seeming end, at least on the charts. 1971 saw Johnny's company, Lewis Young Productions, develop the television series Young Talent Time, which would go on to become a landmark of Australian entertainment, launching careers from Jamie Redford and Debbie Byrne to Tina Arena and Danny Minogue. It was an exhausting undertaking. The pressures of young talent time, time just absorbed so much of Johnny's energies while he, was, that while he kept writing, it was almost entirely to fill holes in the new series. With the young talent time team, he wrote and sang Reach for the Sun, which was featured in the short film Caravan Holiday. There was the odd outside placing, such as a Ray Burgess um, B-side called, called Lightning's Child, but effectively his run, Johnny's run as king of the charts was at an end. 
But what a run it had been, like nothing before or after in Australian music. He did continue recording, notably the 1973 album A Young Man and His Music and the single Just Another Rock and Roller, perhaps autobi autobiographical. He never lost the touch though. When the Seekers with Judith Durham released their Silver Jubilee album in 93, Johnny co-wrote one of the two new songs included, the inspirational one, One World Love. In March 1990, Young was inducted into the TV Week um, Logies Awards Hall of Fame for, quote, an outstanding and sustained contribution to Australian television. But what has been missing, perhaps until tonight, is an acknowledgement of his role as one of the greatest songwriters in Australian music. Yeah. Tunes, yes, indeed. Indeed, indeed. A tunesmith of immense nat natural gifts. When I spoke to him about his incredible run of success recently, he said that what worked in his favour was being able to turn songs around very, very swiftly. But he also had a remarkable ability to call upon phrases, concepts and melodies which found a place in people's minds, hearts and imaginations. Today he is back essentially where he started, on radio. He is still communicating with people and music is, as always, his medium. He has left us with some precious pop moments and as he said in a 2000 interview, the best time of my life was when I was a kid playing in a rock and roll band. I swear when I was doing Young Talent Time that when I got a little older and I wasn't doing that anymore, then I'd get back to being with my band and being a singer-songwriter like I was in the beginning. Perhaps I'm a little wiser these days, these days, but I never want the adventure to stop. I want to keep going, keep going, you know, let's party. Of course, life is there to be enjoyed, isn't it? Well, amen to that. Now, it needs be said that Johnny didn't write Sunny or Uptight or Chuck Berry's Around and Around, but he did write everything else in that presentation. And what I would like to do is have you even rise to your feet to welcome with the most enormous enthusiasm this beloved son of Australian pop music, this fabulous songwriter. I'm honoured to induct him into the Australian Songwriters Hall of Fame because he is a truly great songwriter, Mr Johnny Young. kiss you tomorrow I'll miss you remember I'll always be true sit down come on and then while I'm away I'll ride home every day and I'll send all my loving to you thank you for that that was just I didn't know I was that good, actually. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I sing that song and it's probably the song I'm most identified with and I didn't write it. <laughs> Which is... Uh, yes, uh, another very famous writer called Paul McCartney did write it for me. I thought that was nice. But the same thing happened to me, you know, because Russell Morris probably had the biggest hit that I've ever written called The Real Thing. And uh, this gorgeous lady sitting next to me at the table, she said, I can't believe that Johnny Young from Young Talent Time wrote the real thing. She just couldn't put the two together. And, you know, people often uh, compliment me on writing the real thing for Russell Morris, but I believe that Russell Morris is one of the greatest, if not the greatest songwriters in Australia at the moment. Isn't he just totally mighty? Three 
big albums and just fantastic. I'm not going to make a long speech. I, I have to tell you that I, I, Brian, two things. Brian Cadd said to me just a couple of weeks ago, those of us who were teenagers in the 60s are the luckiest kids on the block. Yeah? And I was a teenager in the 60s. And, you know, unlike some of the wonderful songwriters that we heard here to, tonight, um, we, we didn't sort of consider ourselves to be songwriters. You know, I just happened to be hanging around Barry Gibbs' house and he'd be sitting there in his lounge room and go, what do you think of this? It's only words and words are all I have to steal your heart away. Oh, yeah, that's nice, Barry, good. You know? <laughs> And a few weeks later, it had been number one on the charts, you know, it was like that. And then uh, Ronnie Burns came to me and said, you know, he wanted to uh, do a song about the Vietnam War. And, and so, but, you know, I said, oh, OK, OK. And I sat down and wrote it. And that's what it was like. It was un unlike Damien, who spends you know, a real lot of time. We were really lucky. We were kids, you know, 1969. God, I was 22. I didn't have a clue about anything, you know, a few joints, few this, few that. <laughs> Apart from that, you know, it was just let's have a good time. And that's what we did. So that's why I really think, and I'll, and I'll keep it really short. Glenn, thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was just beautiful. Glenn A. Baker, what a marvellous man. <laughs> I love you. You're great. I'm inclined to ask you, though, what you thought of Midnight Oil's version of the real thing. Well, I loved it because he called me and, and said, look, we want to do the real thing and I change a few words. I said, Midnight All wants to do one of my songs. I don't care what you do with it. You know? They even called the album The Real Thing. I mean, it was just incredible. And then Kylie Minogue, whose sister was Danny, was with me on Young Talent Time for seven years. She, uh, she didn't even know I wrote The Real Thing. She recorded it and featured it in a movie and didn't even know it had anything to do with me. You know, it's just, it's, it's been a hell, hell of a journey. Two things I'd like to say. One, I'm definitely the luckiest kid on the block. Secondly, my wife is my rock. <laughs> and she's over there. She keeps life real for me, you know, because I'm a kid from the 60s. And if someone's smoking a chuff in the corner, she keeps me away from it. <laughs> oh, that's about all I need to say, I think. But, you know, in reality, let me, let me just say this, folks. We're so lucky to be in the music business, aren't we? You know, don't worry about whether you're going to have number one hit records. Don't worry about you know, whether you can do a deal with a publishing company. You've got to fight for those things, absolutely. You've got to fight for them. You've got to go. And I'm tenacious, as Glenn knows. You know, I'm, I'm no slouch. I'll go and fight for what I can get. You know, the real thing still earns me great money. Subaru keeps playing it on their ads and they keep sending me checks. You know, it makes me very happy because I wrote it 40 years ago. <laughs> and, so, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky, but my wife keeps me real and my children keep me real. And, uh, I lost my son Craig last year to pancreatic cancer and that was a huge, big challenge for me. You know what I did? I sat down and wrote some songs about it. No one will ever hear them, but I wrote some songs about it. So, in conclusion, if you want to be a songwriter, do it for the art. You know, do it for the art. Do it for the balls in it. Do it for the expression you want to make with your life. And if you're lucky, like I've been, and get some wonderful people to record your songs, or if you're talented enough to record them yourself, yeah, good luck to you. But always, you know, do it from your heart. Give it the power. Give it real, real meaning. And, uh, you know, make it count for something. Make it an expression. It's like writing a book, you know. You write a book, you probably never get it published, but it's a wonderful experience to do it. And when I write my book... <laughs> Good night, Australia.
Actually, Johnny, can I just ask you one thing on behalf of the audience here? Yes. Step Back, of course, was written by George Young and Stevie Wright. Is it true that Stevie wrote, Wright wrote the lyrics sitting on the loo? Look, it was very simple. I, I, they were on my television show. I asked them to write me a song. George played me the riff to the real uh, to uh, Step Back, and I, uh, they hadn't written the words. He just had the chorus. Step back and leave all in your love. So I said, "Oh, when can I have the completed song?" And he said, "Come to our hotel room at uh, tomorrow morning. We're staying at a hotel. This was in Perth." And so I had a little tape recorder. Eight o'clock in the morning, I went along to the hotel room. Now, these guys had a big gig the night before. And so I went along to their room, found out what their room was, knocked on the door. The door opened, and there were the Easy Beats with about 12 girls all throughout the room. And George said to Stevie, Stevie, you better write the words to this song. So he went away, because they didn't have en suites or anything like that. Uh, so they went to the, to the bathroom, and uh, Steve went to the bathroom, came back with the lyrics. And we made a recording of it, and I still have that recording. George Young on guitar, Stevie Wright with a very... <laughs> Don't you fall out of it, you know, but, you know. But within three weeks I had it recorded, and within two months it was number one around Australia. That was pretty good, eh? You've got to have some ambition. Right, so you want me to sing a song? We I think a, so. I think that's a pretty got a reasonable band? thing. Oh, yes, we got a band. Open the curtain. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Glenn. Okay, thank you. These boys were all in 60s bands. And they've given up the drugs. No, they haven't. These days they're on blood pressure pills and... <laughs> Viagra. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Well, we haven't had much of a run with this, but this is a couple of songs. The, the, the song Smiley that I wrote, it was arranged for the record by the fabulous John Farrar, who Glenn Mar man mentioned before, one of Australia's greatest, who wrote hopelessly devoted to you for uh, Olivia and a whole bunch of other songs. He did the arrangement for this for the record. We're going to do the simple arrangement I did when I wrote it for a song that I wrote for uh, Ronnie Burns. It's called Smiley. Now there's background to this because um, Ronnie came to me and said I'd like you to write a song about the Vietnam War and I had no experience except for Normie Rowe. Now you all know Normie Rowe, right? one of Australia's biggest pop stars. And uh, I'd toured with Normie in the early 60s, and then he went away to war. Now, when we were touring together, we had laughter and songs to sing. We had a wonderful time. You know, it was just beautiful. But when he came back from the war, he was an angry young man, as you might have noticed when he smacked Ron Casey in the mouth on television. <laughs> so this is that song. My version.
Give a little country clap Smiley You're out in the world, forget it Smiley You're all on your own Smiley, hey You say you're a man today Boy, how you've grown Oh, Smiley <laughs> My wife said to me, did you do your practice this morning? <laughs> How you doing? You off the drugs too? Yeah, good for you. The real thing. How can I tell you about the real thing? There's a meaning there, but the meaning there doesn't really mean a thing. That's the words. The reason why I wrote this song was because so many things in life tell you that they're the real thing. Religion, politics, Coca-Cola, it's the real thing. But I sort of figure that you, me, us, we're the real thing, the only real thing. Yeah. Come and see the real thing, come and see the real thing, come and see. Come and see the real thing, come and see the real thing, come and see. There's a meaning there, but the meaning there doesn't really mean a thing. Come and see the real thing, come and see the real thing, come and see. We are the real.
Thank you very much. Thank you for the great honour. Where are you, Glenn? Rescue me. Thank you. I thought I'd let you just soak up some of the affection, Johnny. Soak up some of the affection. We love him dearly, do we do we not? Fabulous songs from a lovely man. Thank you. I think can you can you sit down now? Yeah, I think so.